So let's talk about Easter lilies. And this is going to be the, um, this will be the last in the blooming pot plant section. And we're going to start with bedding plants next week. Um, Easter lilies, um, Easter uh, lilies have a lot of um, uh, myth to them. A lot of, they're used, uh, it's, it's used as a, as a, um, a uh, plant that, uh, specifically for the Easter season, not to promote any specific religion, but um, the um, uh, Easter lily is targeting a, a Christian uh, celebration, a Christian feast day, so we want to spend a little bit of time about the Easter lily. Now the Easter lily is a fairly modern plant in floriculture. It's Lilium longiflorum. It's native to uh, southern um, gr archipelago group of islands uh, in the southern part of Japan, including Okinawa, Animi, and Erabu. And it's uh, 30 degrees north latitude, which in the United States is equivalent to New Orleans. Uh, its photo period, uh, very, that particular part of the world is between, varies between 10 hours of daylight to 14 hours of daylight, and the mean temperature is 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So it sounds like a pretty nice place to live. Um, so where is uh, this southern archipelago? Um, it's way south in the Philippine Sea. Um, and it was first collected by Peter Thunberg. And you've probably all heard the Latin name Thunbergii and a lot of different plants. So he was a plant collector. And he first sent it to England in around 1819. So it's been propagated. It comes from um, rocky seacoast uh, soils. It's native to the fairly alkaline and uh, that part of the region. Now the commercial production of Easter lilies uh, really didn't start happening until about 1853 when it was carried to the Bermuda Islands by sailors. And um, almost all the lilies at this particular time were grown in the Bermuda Islands until um, a, a virus infestation and a ne nematode infestation completely wiped out um, all of the production there. And it was uh, brought to uh, Philadelphia by uh, the wife of Thomas Sargent, uh, another um, plant collector and taxonomist in, those in that era. Um, and it was brought in as a along with the regular garden lilies, and it will bloom in early summer. And I have several Easter lilies planted in my flower beds, and it blooms around in Fort Collins around the 1st of June. And William Harris uh, was a friend of um, Mrs. Sargent, and he developed it for the local florist trade. Now, the bulb industry for Easter lilies primarily centered in Japan and somewhat in the southern United States. But the United States was almost totally dependent on shipping all the Easter lily bulbs into the United States from Japan. And um, shortly after World War I, a man named Louis Houghton uh, brought in a suitcase of hybrid lily bulbs to the southern coast of Oregon. I was going to show you a little video at the end of this uh, session that talks a little bit more about the southern coast of Oregon and the Easter Lily production. And he distributed them amongst his friends and began the, um, a lot of Easter Lily production on the west coast. Now, World War II happened to cut off the supply of Easter Lily bulbs to the United States because they were coming from Japan and we happened to be at war with Japan. So um, the value of Easter Lily bulbs at that particular time just went out the roof because there was no bulbs available. And all these hobby growers on the West Coast that were growing Easter Lily bulbs and sharing them with their friends became commercial growers. And at one point, Easter Lily bulbs were sold from or grown from Long Beach, California to Portland, all up and down the West Coast. And by 1945, uh, the Pacific Northwest was booming, and well, actually all as far north as Vancouver, BC, and there was about 1,200 growers. Now, 
after World War II, um, the, the lily bulb center of Japan just really never recovered. In fact, during World War II on those islands in Okinawa, uh, with the embargoes and, and with uh, the pressures that Japan was under during World War II, the farmers were starving and they ate their Easter lily bulbs to survive. So modern production today, Easter lilies, uh, there's only about 10 farms left in the whole United States. And they're isolated in Northern California and Southern Oregon coastal region. Um, and almost all the easterly bulbs are grown and shipped from this location. Now the tradition of the Easter lily, uh, it's, it's white flower is a symbol of purity, um, virtue. Uh, you read uh, the New Testament. Uh, Jesus told his, lily, his listeners, you consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And uh, Solomon in all his glories was not arrayed like one of these. Now, other traditions uh, say that white lilies sprung from the ground where Christ's tears fell in the garden of Gethsemane. And um, in Christian traditions, lily also rec is recognized as the white-robed apostle of hope. So there's lots of traditions in um, Christianity. Dipping back further back into religions, the Greek mythologies um, claim, uh, write that lilies came from the milk of Hera. Who was Hera? Who's my Greek mythologist, anybody? Wife of Zeus, and was she mortal or she was immortal? Right, okay, good. The, white, the pure white lily is typically associated with Virgin Mary, um, and the angel Gabriel uh, is pictured, often pictured of greeting Mary with a lily. And so it's very tied to Easter. And at Easter time, most Christian churches just cover their altar with Easter lilies. It's one of the top three potted floral crops in, in $9.1 million with the Easter lilies sold in 2000. If anything, it's gone down a little bit. Um, and the majority of the production of Easter lilies is in uh, today is in Michigan and California and shipped everywhere else. Now, the, the planting cycle for growing the Easter lily bulb, it's a three-year cultivation period. They're dug and harvested three times during that three years. And one of the things that, why the Easter lily is thought to be part of Christianity is that the Easter lily is born to live again. So the planting and replanting process from mid-October to mid-August to late October is the primary field season. So the Easter lily growers today are in the field working vigorously. And what they're trying to do is harvest their bulbs uh, at the end of the summer and get it all done, harvested and replanted before the fall rain. And it's, all this takes place in this season. So a grower will take 24 hours off, 24 hours to trim off the new growth. Uh, that means skimming the plants in the field. Then gather the, the bulbs from the field digging, clean wash. The critical part is the, the reclassification and sorting because some of the bulbs will be sold, some of the bulbs will be replanted, and they'll all be sorted according to size, and to replant. And we call it skim, dig, wash, sort, drop. And that's the procedure. Skim, they're cutting off the top of the plant. Um, digging, they're gathering the bulbs from the field. Cleaning, they're, uh, the wash part, they're cleaning the dirt and the soil. Reclassification, they're sorting them into sizes. Replant for drop. So it's kind of a big cycle. And um, here you can see the planting crew replanting. Um, it's all hand done, even though they're, they're laying on a tractor. Um, the field skimmer is cutting the bulbs. Field digger, it's um, basically a potato digger. Sorting, it's, it's a potato sorting machine. And cleaning, of course, they're just washing and sorting. Um, easterly bulbs. Um, Cannot, they have problems with the rain and sun without the assistance and, uh, without assistance from us. That the first year bulbs um, 
do not have an adequate energy to, to generate a bloom, so that's why they're trimmed off. Second year bulbs can't tolerate wet winter soil, so we're going to dig them up so they're not wet all, wet all winter long. And the third year bulbs require more space to grow and develop a fuller bulb because we're getting more money for the larger bulb size. And part of this cycle is, you know, we're not, we're not growing flowers at this point. And what this crew is doing is they're actually going through a field and, and I know the quality of the picture is not very good, but they're going through this field uh, and um, actually removing the flowers because we want to take the energy of the plant and force it into the bulb and not into the in, uh, into the bulb itself into the bloom itself. <coughs> so during the bulb harvest period, they're looking at the appropriate soil and air temperature time. Um, they're wanting to harvest the bulbs as soon as the bulbs have hit their maximum stage of growth for that year because we don't want any decline. And what um, the growers will do to start their commercial production is they start out with what's called a bulb let. There's bulb bills, bulb lets, right? You think from uh, plant propagation class. And they're removed from the mother plant and those bulb lets are dropped into the soil. Um, and that's how we start the uh, production cycle. The following spring, the bulb let sends up a growth tip and they're debloomed and plants energy channel their, their photosynthates into the, into the bulb and then the commercial size bulbs are dug and graded in the fall. So this is um, a schematic of what size, mar uh, where the market is. Uh, Ace and Nellie White are the two primary um, easterly cultivars that are sold today. Um, and they're graded on what we call a six to seven, seven to eight, eight to nine, nine to 10. And these are the bulb size classifications. So when you say, I'm gonna order a case of seven eights, that means you're gonna, you're gonna get 250 bulbs per case, but you can expect three to, three to four blooms per plant. And where this is important is if you're marketing to a specific market, for instance, if you're a large grower and you're marketing to a chain market, they're gonna have a specification that says, okay, I want three to five blooms per plant. So that means you need to buy in the right size bulb. If you bought in a bulb that's too small, or if you bought in a bulb that's too big, because the case prices of these are all about the same. All about the same but 100 bulbs per case versus 300 bulbs per case is a very different uh, value if, they're, if the case all costs the same. Yes? So in the highest grade, it flowers in a shorter period and has more flowers? So the highest grade, a number 10, okay, it's going to, it's a very large bulb, okay, and it's going to have, it has the most energy, so it's going to flower faster, and it's going to grow faster, and it's going to produce more blooms. But that number 10 bulb, you're going to probably have to put that in an 8 or a 10 inch pot because it's very large. Whereas the 7 eighths are for 6 inch pots. So you need to be going for a very specific market with this particular bulb because that's very expensive. So the number of bulbs per pot is going to be based upon your market. So like for instance, some if you got a bargain on those smaller bulbs, you might put three bulbs per pot to get your bloom count up. Or if you had a bulb, if you had a uh, poor quality bulb, you may have to plant, r replant to get your bloom count up to meet your market demands. So it's very, it's a very tricky formula. So a single nose, which is just one head. Uh, one bulb tip is going to have is a six to ten grade, and that's this is the most common five to six inch pot of most m most growers. Uh, growers that are focusing on, on a high end um, church market where they need bigger plants for display will tend to go to a larger bulb, but they've already got a market that's established. Easter lily is um, a true bulb. It's a true, um, it's a 
Typically, it's, it's actually a compressed shoot. It's what we call a scaly bulb. Um, it's the, repro the vegetative reproduction organism organ. It has a basal plate, and the scales are the fleshy leaves and it attached. Now this is a non-tunicate bulb. A tunicate bulb is, example, could would be a it would be a what? A tulip, amaryllis, or an onion. Tunicate it means that it cloaks. It, it, tunic means cloak, and it's surrounding the basal plate. Where these are scaly, where we have layers of scales. Easter lily bulbs are never dormant. It, in relation, in comparison to other bulbs like the tulip, which actually goes through a dormancy period. But in order to flower that bulb, it has to be vernalized. And that vernalization is a cold, moist treatment, and um, the bulbs must be moist in a, to perceive this cooling period. Now, the optimum vernalization temperature, of course, is cultivar specific. ACE requires 38 to 40. Nellie White is 40 to 45. Um, to be honest with you, I've never grown anything but Nellie White, so I've never dealt with ACE to see if there's how much different between the temperatures. So the cycle of what you're going to do is uh, there's a couple of different production practices for Easter lilies. We have natural cooling, case cooling, and um, greenhouse cooling. The natural cooling process is probably the oldest practice that Easter lily growers have used, where um, we're going to take bulbs that have been directly harvested and shipped to you that have never, that have not gone through a chilling period. And what we do what is we take those bulbs and we pot them up in their, pl in their pots and we take that to a minimally heated area, could be a shade frame, and we're trying to keep it as close to 30 to 35 degrees as possible. This is the old style, just putting out in a shade frame. A lot of growers, what they would do too, uh, for a little more control, is they would put them in a, a raised bed outdoors and they'd pile straw on top, okay? That's the old practice. And under this practice, it needs 1,000 hours of temperature at around 40 degrees Fahrenheit. 1,000 hours of chilling. In fruit classes, you're going to talk here, when you talk about peaches and apples, you'll talk about chilling hours. And it's the number of chilling hours it requires to take that vegetative meristem and convert it to a reproductive meristem. This requires very little equipment and um, but you don't have a whole lot of control, precision. Case cooling, this is where the easterly bulbs, easterly, easterly bulbs are sh typically shipped in a wooden crate uh, packed with sphagnum moss, not sphagnum peat moss, but sphagnum moss, or shredded cedar, which is called shingle toe, okay? And what you'll do is the shipping crates are, are uh, shipped to you and they could be either shipped pre-cooled by the bulb supplier, or you could ship them to your operation and chill them yourself. What would be the differences between those two tactics? Time, but it's also assuming that you have a cooler. If you don't have a cooler, you're gonna bring them in case cooled. You're gonna bring them in pre-cooled for you but you're assuming that they cooled them correctly. If they didn't cool them correctly or if they got hot in transit, some of the bulbs may be devernalized. So a lot of growers will tend to bring in their bulbs themselves and case cool them themselves so they know for a fact that they've been vernalized correctly. So the commercial supplier you know, oftentimes ships in a commercial cold storage facility Vernalized bulbs shipped to the grower or the grower does the case cooling. And then the grower pots up the vernalized bulbs for forcing. And this is done 17 weeks before Easter. You want to avoid any temperature during this period greater than 70 degrees Fahrenheit because that's going to devernalize. So if you've got a real, if, if it's not coming on a commercial shipper that that is, uh, 
prepared to ship plant material, you're running into problems. The third type of uh, cooling scenario is what we call case cooling, in-house case cooling, where you get your own. You control the environment. One thing that you need to remember is that your case, the cooling, the bulbs do not start to vernalize until the total case becomes cool. So in other words, it's got to sit in that cooler for almost a week before the whole box is cool. Okay? So you get uniform penetration into, the, into that. It needs to be cooled for six weeks, and then again, your 17 weeks scenario. Oftentimes, right after um, potting, the plants will take the case cooled bulbs and keep them at a, at a low temperature, 63 to 65 degrees, so that we want to see root growth. And we typically want to see root growth <coughs> in the, from the bulbs. It'll go out laterally, hit the side of the pot, and grow down. And it's when we uh, hit the bottom of the pot, that's when we start our production cycle. So that's case cooling in-house. And the final stage is what we call controlled temperature forcing. And this is where a grower brings in bulbs from the supplier that have not been cooled. And they'll pot them in their pots, plant them, and they're going to grow them at a, at a fairly cool temperature, 63 degrees Fahrenheit, um, and have so where the bulbs are actually rooted into the pot. At this point, then, those pots with the bulbs inside are moved into the cooler and cooled for seven weeks. This gives us the highest flower count, lower, less foliage, higher quality plant, and a lot of precision in your production. But it requires what? Space for a bunch of pots. Space for a bunch of pots to grow and a cooler to put those pots into the cooler. So it means a su pretty significant commitment to space and to this crop. So Easter lily vernalization. Um, and here's where we count weeks. Week 52 is what? What week is week 52? It's the week that's between Christmas and New Year's, okay? We work back, and here we have weeks to flower, okay? And our week number, so we've got 14 weeks from Christmas, this in the year 2003, and just to look at the scenarios of how you do case cool versus controlled temperature versus natural cool. As a grower, which one do you want to do? Which one do you, would you prefer? Case cool. Why would you prefer case cool? Space. What about control temperature forcing? Most precision. Natural cooling is the most risk, but also the cheapest. So it depends on the facilities you have and your own skill levels. And what else you have in that greenhouse. Soil, well drained, well aerated. We plant these plants at the bottom of the pot for stability. Some growers like to have something kind of heavy so that it doesn't get so it has some ballast to it, so it's not going to tip on the bench or tip in the retail or in home environment. Uh, need a good cation exchange capacity. Remember, this grows in alkaline soils on the beaches in Okinawa. So a pH 6.5 to 7 requires some calcium, a little bit of phosphorus as well. Now, when we plant this, we're going to trim off the broken basal plate roots. And the bulb is going to be towards the bottom of the pot. And the stem roots, these are the roots that are going to grow to the side of the pot and grow down. The stem roots are what's going to do most of our rooting. We use a standard, a standard height um, pot. Standard uh, height pots are, are equal distance in height to their diameter. Um, an azalea pot, for instance, a six-inch azalea pot is only four and a half inches to five inches tall, 
depending on the manufacturer. We want the nose of the bulb, which is the top of the bulb, at least two inches from the top of the soil. And we want the basal plate, the bottom of the bulb, one inch from the bottom so when the pot is saturated with water, it's not sitting in water at the bottom of the pot. Okay? Now, we're going to, the minute we plant these, we're going to water them immediately to settle the soil, and then we're going to follow with a second irrigation uh, with, a, with a fungicide. Almost all growers of Easter lilies, as soon as they've been potted up, are going to apply a fungicide. Because remember, these came out of field soil, and now we're moving into greenhouse condition. And the, the likelihood of Pythium and Rhizoctonia from a foreign source coming into your greenhouse is pretty high. At this point, and always, Easter lilies are remained con constantly moist. We, they do not want to ever dry out, or because any wilting will damage the bulb. They're heavy feeders. Uh, a lot of growers will blend a control lease control lease fertilizer in with their potting soil and feed at the same time. 200 and 250 parts per million, the standard ratio, 212. Um, we want to avoid ammonium, just like always, because we need to keep the pH fairly high in this. And we're not going to terminate our feed two weeks before production like we would with a mom or a poinsettia. These plants need to have fertilizer up to the day they leave the greenhouse. Now, Easter lily height, we typically want a ratio, and this is set by the Produce Marketing Association, 2.6 to 1. In other words, a 15.6 inch plant in a 6-inch pot, that is our market. And uh, mass marketers are, are the ones that are setting the standards, and they're shooting for a little bit shorter plant, a little bit shorter pot, so that they ship better on racks for that market. Um, height control in Easter lilies is a trick. Um, some growers will tell you that growing Easter lilies is like uh, growing a crop in a wheelbarrow. Because you're constantly going through your greenhouse and measuring your plant height and moving your plants from warm spots to cool spots to control how high, how tall they're growing and how fast they're blooming. Because you've got cool spots at the cooling at the cooling wall and warm spots at the fans. So growing under long days you get higher plants, low light, taller plants, lo poor <coughs> fertility, higher taller plants, high temperatures, taller plants, close spacing, taller plants, and all of these things together are going to get us away from this, this goal so quite often we have to do that, a lot of that control with plant growth regulators. So we do a practice is called graphical tracking, where we go back, work backwards from Easter to your 14 weeks. This is uh, your, your pot height, and you have a target window where you have your maximum height and your minimum height, and we want to keep our plant in here, in this window, and we use the concept of average daily temperature to control both the plant height and the speed of flowering. We can also use diff to control plant height and all the plant growth regulators work very well. Most growers use um, the triazole growth regulators, um, which is A-Rest and uh, Bonsai and um, Sumagic. So here's a typical crop where a grower is growing their crop and you can see the dotted line in the middle is the actual plant height and here up on top you can see where the grower has used diff um, to control the plant height uh, to keep, him, keep their crop within that window of plant height. When you walk into an east of the greenhouse, the first thing a grower will do is they bend down and they look across the crop to see where everything is. And a lot of growers actually have little pieces of tape um, on their posts in the greenhouse to kind of give them a, a ballpark figure of where their plant height is 
according to how many weeks they've got left before the crop is to be moved out of the greenhouse. So in the greenhouse, we're going to plant these spot, uh, pot to pot until we get flower initiation. So that's about two and a half pots per square foot. Um, we're going to take our bench and we're going to put the taller plants towards the outside because they're going to need fuller, uh, more intensity, more light intensity to make them grow shorter and the shorter plants to the inside. So we're always moving plants around. East lilies are high light plants, which means you need to have a clean roof. Of course, we're growing this in the winter time, so you need to get as much light into that greenhouse as possible. Now, some growers will do uh, what's uh, it's called insurance lighting, and <coughs> where we'll um, do a, a photo period uh, extension. And what this does is it gives us a, it offsets some of the cold uh, treatment requirement. So, for instance, if maybe we had a, a, a problem with the cooler or something like that, we can use that uh, to offset some lack of chilling. And it can go up to two, it can shorten your chilling period up to two weeks. Um, so if you've got your bulbs in late or you didn't get your bul bulbs potted up in time, you didn't get them in the cooler, uh, or if Easter is really early and you're trying to push things, by giving them a uh, 10 to 2, 10, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. Uh, lighting with incandescent bulbs will give you some um, uh, offset some of your chilling requirement. And we want to do this right as the flower bulb is emerging because that's when the flower bulb is uh, actively forming its uh, meristematic region. If Easter is late, we never do this because we, we don't want to push it, our crop too fast. What's an Easter lily worth the day after Easter? Not even that. It's not worth anything. So it requires a lot of precision and a lot of attention to detail. The first thing that controls your margin of error is the quality of your bulbs. And buying good quality bulbs, buying good quality from a good quality vendor is going to be very important. We have to have 120 days of forcing time in the greenhouse, but sometimes Easter is early and we may have less than 90. It's a 30 day window. Because Easter is on a different day of every year. Easter is controlled by whom? Hallmark? By the calendar company? It's controlled, it's by tradition, Roman Orthodox, Roman Catholic Easter, which is different than Eastern Orthodox Easter, always falls on the first Sunday that follows the first full moon after the vernal equinox. Let me say that again. Easter Sunday for, falls on the first Sunday that follows the first full moon after the vernal equinox. So it can be anywhere from March 22nd to April 25th. So looking at these calendar dates, March, um, your phase of the moon, where did I get this phase of the moon chart? Anybody know where phases, where the best place to get your phases of the moon? This is provided by the Department of Navy. And why is the Navy interested in the moon? Because it controls the tide. So the most accurate form t place to find uh, phases of the moon is not the farm, farm, farmer's almanac, which is usually correct. It is the Department of Navy. Okay. And the vernal equinox is what day? What is the vernal equinox? That is the day that where the day length and the is night length is the same. That's just from the end of winter to the beginning of spring. So our target is 
Palm Sunday, because that's exactly one week before Easter Sunday, most vendors don't want Easter lilies in their retail store until Palm Sunday or later. However, it's just like uh, Christmas and everything else. Everything seems to be pushed up, pushed up, pushed up. If you were to go to Home Depot or Lowe's today, all the Christmas displays are already out. I don't believe you. Hmm? You're setting them up last night. Yeah. So, um, I mean, can't we get through Halloween first? Actually, I think Kohl's had their Christmas displays up in August. Yeah. Halloween is becoming a, a larger and larger market. Um, anyway, so this uh, knowing when you're when you're targeting your crop, because remember, just like all the crops we deal with, we start on the harvest date and work backwards. And Easter lilies are a prime example. So these are the cultivars that are primarily sold um, in the United States and Europe. 80% um, if you were to order Easter lilies today, you're going to get Nellie White. And actually if you ordered Easter lilies today, you're already too late because they're already sold. Um, some by Slocum's Ace. And looking at your range of um, Easter and key forcing dates, um, we use a um, parts of the, the calendar, the Christian calendar to schedule our crop. Um, if it's considered to be early, that means the first Sunday of Lent is in February. If it's medium, the first Sunday of Lent is in late February, and so forth and so forth. And anywhere from March 19th to April 15th for Palm Sunday. What is the first day of Lent? It's a target day for producing this crop. It's called, the first Wednesday of Lent is called Ash Wednesday. The Tuesday before Ash Wednesday is called <coughs> Fat Tuesday. I would expect you guys to answer that question more quickly. That's Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras. Okay, so planting to shoot emergence. And this is a critical part because we're dealing with a bulb crop. Of course, our bulb is covered with a substrate. The controlling factor at this point is temperature, water, of course. The bulb is developing its root system and shoot growth. As it's, we're looking at shoot growth, this is after we take it out of the cooler and bring it into the greenhouse, we need to keep it around 60 to 63, but under 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So a lot of growers do not use bottom heat on this crop because they don't want to get too warm. And it should, your shoot emergence, you should start to see shoot tip at two weeks. You're yes. using bottom heat, something between like 80 degrees, what water, what temperature of water would have to be running below? Actually, the water temperature is not going to control the soil temperature very much, unless you're watering it constantly. No, 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 the bottom heat, if you're using bottom heat. If you're using bottom heat, the water temperature is not going to cool the soil effectively and keep it cool. Now, one of the things we talk about with Easter lilies is the leaf unfolding rate. This is a determinate blooming plant because the terminal apex is where we get initiation of flower buds. Night temperature 60 to 63. We want to keep our day temperatures cool because higher temperatures is going to delay flowering. And flower initiation of our vernalized stems is going to happen around the 19th of January when we bring our plants out. Now, that time of stretch from when we have the shoot emergence to flower initiation, this is where we should have about half of our stem growth. And all the leaves under the developing flower bud will have developed. Okay? They may be microscopic, but they've developed. 
And at this point, the flower buds are starting to become exposed. This stage should be the first Sunday of Lent. Okay? Now, the average daily temperature, average daily temperature affects the visible blood to flower, and this is the, the temperature we measure it like 10, 20 times a day and take the average of that. 55 to 85, you can see visible fl bud to flower after this stage. This is how we control our bloom cycle. And if you're going to get it too warm, you can assume this is how many days you're going to delay your crop. So we're talking days here. We're actually, produ we're actually predicting this by the day, not predicting it by the week. Now, the time to visible bud, to open flower, this is the time to fine tune your development. So you're looking at when you're going to ship your crop for Easter. Um, if your plants are growing too fast, you move them to a cooler greenhouse or a cooler part of the greenhouse. If they're growing slow, you can move it to a warmer part. So what we mean by growing easterly is you grow them in a wheelbarrow because you're constantly moving the plants. And we're going to market them when the oldest flower that's emerged has hit a stage of the technical term puffy white. Time to visible bud to, to the puffy white stage at 63 degrees Fahrenheit, average daily temperature is 35 days. The puffy white stage, if you have to have it at, by Palm Sunday, you must be at the puffy white stage or your crop is not worth a dime. Now, most growers shoot for temperatures between 60 and 70 to control their plant development because when we get over 70, you know, hitting this over 70 average daily temperature, you're going to run into problems. They're determinate. Once the apical meristem initiates its flower buds, no more leaves will be formed. All the leaves are there. And we can use what's called a leaf unfolding rate and do a leaf count to determine how fast or how slow our crop is growing. So what we do is we take the total number of leaves compared to the leaves that have not unfolded to determine the stage of development. And we can modify that by temperature. And we start this at the time of flower initiation till we see flower bud. That's when we start our leaf counting. So leaf counting assumes that we're going to destroy a handful of plants. This is a destructive measurement. So around the middle of January, when we're hoping that we have flower bud formation, we're going to remove the bulb from the soil and to make sure that we've got good root development. And then we're going to take it with a hand lens and a sharp knife, and we're going to dissect the uh, apical meristem to make sure that it's converted to a, from a vegetative meristem to a reproductive meristem. And it's pretty distinct. Where an Easter lily, a vegetative meristem is going to have a round apical meristem, where if it's gone through the conversion for a um, reproductive meristem, it's going to have an, a nub in the middle of it. And that means that we have flower set. Flower initiation has occurred. At this point, the leaf number is fixed. No new leaves will be formed. So th at that point, we take the leaves below the reproductive meristem, and we count them, and we count the ones that are still microscopic compared to the ones that are fully expanded. So the m ones that are fully expanded, we already, those have already unfolded, but the ones that are microscopic on compressed on the stem, and we're looking at about two to four inches of stem where we're counting 30, 40, 50 leaves. So how does this relate? Well. Our average daily temperature controls our leaf unfolding rate. 53 is one leaf per day. 69 is 1.8 leaves per day. And this is how we predict our crop. We look at the leaf unfolding rate. Some people use a bud meter uh, to track the elongation of the flower buds. Once the flower bud has started to elongate, you see visible bud. 
to see, and it, you can use a bud meter. And this is developed by Heiner Leith at uh, University of California in Davis. And it shows how many days until the bud will flower. And we use this to um, determine whether or not we're going to ship the plant or put the plant in the cooler. If we're ahead of season, we're lucky. We can take those Easter lily plants and put them in a cooler and store them. They're just happy as can be. But we can't speed them up unless we heat the greenhouse. So if we want to stop them, if they're early, we can put them in the cooler. And in fact, that's what a lot of growers do is they'll force them out, get them into the cooler so they can have a bedding plant cycle. Because when you start looking at the price of what it costs to grow Easter lilies compared to the dollars that you're going to get per square foot, bedding plants make more money. So here's a picture of the leaf bud meter. And they've got the temperatures and how many days to flower on, the, on for Nellie White. And of course, there's a leaf bud meter for all the cultivars, but Nellie White is the most common. So to get the leaf bud meter is you just go to Heiner's website, download the sheet, cut it out, laminate it. Done. Done. Pretty sophisticated instrument. So when you're using the leaf bud meter, or even if you're doing the leaf bud count, uh, the leaf when you're doing your leaf counting, you take a representative sample. And you're going, to be, you're going to begin this measurement on the largest, oldest flower on each of the selected plants. And this is you use it um, by putting it up against the base of the flower bud and using your meter. And of course, looking at your average daily temperature, pull the two together. If the number of days to flowering is too long or too short, then you're going to have to modify your temperature. If it's too late to delay flowering, we're going to put those plants in the cooler. We use a leaf bud meter to determine if we're going to put the plant in the cooler or keep it out in the greenhouse. And if we need a temperature greater than 81 degrees Fahrenheit to get finish off your crop, you're screwed. Because what's an Easter lily worth the day after Easter? Nothing. Plant growth regulators. Um, Easter lilies, um, most people use uh, A-Rest, or uh, some people use Bonsai and Sumagic, but A-Rest is the, is the growth regulator of choice for most Easter lily growers. Uh, DIF is very effective, but you need to make sure that you're not changing your average daily temperature too much, or you're going to run into problems using DIF. Uh, Easter lilies don't attract a lot of insect problems, like very few. You can get some aphids and stuff, but most people, problems with uh, Easter lilies are going to be uh, fungus gnats <coughs> from overwatering. Remember, this is a plant, a crop that we're not going to allow to get dry, so it's, you have to be careful and maintain uh, good water control so you don't overwater to the point where you get fungus gnat populations. Any diseases we get with Easter lilies is going to be related to soil borne. And typically, we see our soil borne diseases early in the cropping cycle from dirty bulbs. There's a condition um, that happens in the cooler, and it's called lower leaf yellowing. Whereas when we put that um, plant in the cooler, we're not using any light, right? And they have a tendency to get yellow. And if we store them too long, they're going to get yellow. And we'll use a product called Fascination, which is a blend of cytokinin, benzylidinine specifically, and gerberillins, a blend of gerberillin 4 and 7. And these two products put together were originally used for um, apple production to improve the post-harvest color of apples. And the cytokinin and the gerberillins together is an anti-aging compound. And in fact, if you were to take benzylidine and drop it onto a green leaf late in the summer, that part of the leaf, when the other parts of the tree starts to color and go into yellow, that little circle of cytokinins will prevent. It will never not turn green. Or the green chlorophyll will stay there. So what we do is, before we move our plants into the cooler, is we spray them with fascination. And um, it, what it does is it um, delays the yellowing of the plant. 
And so, for instance, these particular plants, um, this is research on uh, uh, stargazer lilies done at Cornell University. Uh, I think these plants were like 35 days in the cooler. In fact, we have left blooming plants in the cooler and forgotten them as long as six months and that have been sprayed with fascination and they're still green. Flower bud abortion, um, high forcing temperatures, low light. Epinasty, uh, and that's when the foliage tends to curl down too much. It's caused by ethylene gas in the greenhouse. Uh, we also get ethylene gas in the greenhouse through oversleeving, leaving the plant in the sleeve too long. Um, some people use subdue fungicide, the older <coughs> subdue, um, which is not marketed anymore. Change this. Subdue Max is the new version, causes white tip burn, and Subdue Max does not. You're going to hear about Easter lilies with cats. We hear a lot of uh, about plant poisoning and stuff like that. And Easter lily, in fact, um, uh, a cat eating Easter lily leaves can get very sick. Uh, it causes um, complete kidney failure. And vomiting, lethargy, lack of appetite, uh, kidney failure. You have to eat, a, a cat's got to eat a lot of Easter lilies to do this. I've had Easter lilies in my home every year and I have two cats. Um, they vomit all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Hair balls. I have a long, a long haired 20 pound tomcat. Um, lack of appetite, not him. But they don't, they don't, they seem to not ingest the plants. But this is a problem and it is a real problem, it's not a myth. In 1919, a returning World War I soldier brought home a suitcase full of mysterious bulbs to Southern Oregon. By World War II, acres of these flowers, nicknamed white gold, bloomed up and down the West Coast. Join us as we head to a farm in Brookings to find out what's so special about these flowers. If you're lucky, on a warm summer day at the coast, you might happen upon what seems to be a lost corner of the Garden of Eden. For a few days in July, this is where the lilies bloom, their sweet fragrance drifting out to sea. All those white trumpet-shaped flowers that herald springtime come from here, making this the Easter lily capital of the world. Of the lilies grown for Easter in the United States and Canada, virtually 100% come from right here, Smith River, or, uh, California, and Brookings, Oregon, right here in this little 10-mile stretch. Harry Harms would know. He's been growing lilies here in Brookings for 25 years. Uh, the big ones go to the next grader, which breaks them into four sizes. The Easter lily has a rich history. An ancient myth says that the flower sprang from the milk of the Queen of Heaven. In the Bible, Mary was given lilies at the birth of Christ. Even the story of how it got to America is an intriguing one. The longiform bulb is from uh, the southern islands of Japan and were uh, located by missionaries uh, in the 1800s. Uh, eventually some made their way to Bermuda. Some uh, Philadelphia florists were in the Bermudas vacationing saw them blooming in time for Easter and made arrangements to have some dug up and shipped back to Philadelphia. And a hundred year old tradition of potted lilies for Easter began. It's July and workers are disbudding flowers that are just at their peak. That's why if you see a field in bloom like this, consider it a treat because the primary function of this farm is to produce bulbs. In this particular plant's case, it has two reproductive cycles. The first one is flowering and the second one is bulbing. We as suppliers of bulbs are really much more interested in the second phase. So the sooner that we can get it out of the first phase of flowering and into the second phase, the bigger the bulbs get. And so we pick them off early in an effort to trigger them into this next phase and start storing food into the bulb. 
That's because the bulbs are bought by nurseries all over the country, forcing them to bloom early for Easter. It's autumn now, and Harry tells us what it takes to bring these fragile beauties to flower at exactly the right time. Okay, well, um, you know, we have a tractor that comes through and actually makes the trench or the furrow and puts some fertilizer down and distributes the bulbs. Then we send a crew through who ride on a machine known as a creeper, and they set all of these bulbs root down uh, and in a uh, spacing that gives us a, a density of so many per foot. Planting is not the only thing that's going on here in the fall. Easter lilies are a three-year process. It takes us about three years to get the bulb large enough that it has a high enough flower count for the demands of the forcing trade. And so uh, each and every year, uh, everything must be dug up and replanted uh, and uh, dipped in fungicide and planted in fresh, clean soil. At some point, the bulbs that were already three years old are generally large enough to be sold. Now comes the final test for all the work Harry has done for each bulb. They must bloom in a greenhouse in time for Easter, a process that requires exquisite timing. Uh, you have to understand that this greenhouse grower is going to take this bulb and he's going to try to make all of them flower within the two weeks before Easter. And if they flower any earlier than that, he's got big trouble. And if they flower any later than that, he's got bigger trouble. That's why Harry must produce a high quality, reliable bulb that will be at least eight inches in circumference and produce the required four blooms per stock. It's a very challenging crop to grow. Um, most crops, you put them in the ground in 120, maybe 150 days out, you're out of the ground, it's all over with. This crop, we'll plant it now and we won't dig it till maybe next October. So it's anywhere from 11 to 13 months in the same spot. But the challenges of this flower are worth it to Harry. And this one really fascinated me because it's, it's quite a chess match to, uh, to have bulbs come out after three years, the kinds, the quantities, and the quality uh, that you'd like. So it's a real challenging crop to grow. It's the most interesting thing I've done. The Easter Lily Empire once stretched all the way from Vancouver, BC to Long Beach, California. Today, only a few farms remain that supply the world with Easter lilies. And that's it for another edition of Oregon Field Guide. If you have any questions or comments, please drop us a line at Oregon Field Guide, care of OPB, 7140 Southwest McAdam, Portland, Oregon, 97219, or visit our website. And until next week, thanks for joining us. We'll see you then.